fairly early on in the book, we talk about how in the last few years, advancements in uh, neural networks of all types have moved rapidly uh, by the adoption of design patterns. Okay. Uh, many of you have likely got a background as a software engineer or a app software application uh, writer. Okay. And assuming that you're familiar with OOP principles, it's kind of when the idea of design patterns uh, came about. It really was coined by a book uh, written by what was referred to for people as the Gang of Four in the 1990s. And it really just said is, if you have this problem, use that pattern. If you have this problem, use that pattern, so forth and so forth. And that's what's happened to deep learning. Okay. And today I'm going to cover one of the most elementary design patterns in deep learning. It's really one of the first ones to emerge. There's multiple variants of it. The one I'm covering, the idiomatic procedure reuse one, is one that was rendered by me. Okay, So I'm the actual original author of this design pattern. And in my book, I can actually show you the flexibility of the design pattern can actually be retrofitted or reapplied to the past to state-of-the-art architectures like AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, etc. All those really inception, all those really famous ones can be repackaged in this design pattern and written really simple and quick. Okay. Um, Depending on when you got into deep learning, if you go back to about 2015, we didn't have these high level deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. We had these really low level uh, frameworks like Cafe. And those original state of the art uh, models were mostly written in Cafe and they were extremely cryptic to read. And they were written in what you would call a batch style, meaning they're just written linearly, line by line by line by line, and there's no reuse. Okay. When you have a design pattern, it implies there's a pattern, and that pattern is repeated over and over. And being good software engineers, you know, if you have a pattern that's repeated over and over, you make a procedure or a method out of it for reuse. So fundamentally, in a convolutional neural network, we break it down into components, okay? And traditionally, there are three major components, okay? One is referred to as the stem, the other one's referred to as the learner, and then finally as the task. And the stem, the simplest way to do it is it's going to take those uh, images you have, okay? And it does sort of the first coarse level extraction of features, extremely coarse level. And then sizes the feature maps that are going to come out of it, uh, the number and the size, to hit a target here, okay, which I'll describe later. The job of the learner is to, uh, is to do what we call feature learning. It wants to learn the features that are in the image that it's going to need for prediction, okay? And then at the very end of it, you're gonna have what's called the latent space. And we'll go more into that. And the latent space is, is something that is dimensionally substantially smaller than the input here. But from that latent space, it holds the important features we need to know. And you can think of everything else that's in the picture we don't need, if you wanna think of it that way, has been thrown away. So we can focus only on the important things. And then there's finally a task group. And that's where you're going to do the task learning. And for example, you're going to learn to classify what the image is. Or you're going to learn to locate different foreground images within the picture, uh, put a bounding box in it, and classify what's in that, like object detection. Or you might do image segmentation where you're going to actually identify every pixel of what it belongs to. Okay, a, a simple example might be medical. Uh, so you got a chest x-ray and uh, you're looking to say it's cancer and which pixels are the cancer and which pixels aren't. 
So I'll just move on to the next slide. So it's kind of advanced a little bit uh, with TensorFlow 2X. Uh, we brought in this concept of moving data preprocessing uh, into the model itself, and it provided new layers for that support. We refer to that now as a pre-stem group. Okay. So if you look today, our modern uh, convolutional neural networks are designed to, to take data preprocessing uh, into the model. Um, the reason for this is just a lot more efficient. Uh, historically, data preprocessing, uh, like resizing your image or normalizing the pixels, and again, I'm assuming in general uh, people have uh, know the basics here, um, uh, happened upstream from the training on a CPU, and you did your training on a GPU. The problem is, if the CPU couldn't pre-process that data as fast as the GPU could consume it, you would be starving the GPU. Think of the GPU as an engine. If you're not feeding it as much gas as it can burn, it's not running at its full performance. The problem is even worse when you go to multiple GPUs. You're more likely to starve it and have to go to bigger and bigger CPUs. So it just made more sense to move the data preprocessing into the model. And these are called pre-stems because they actually generally don't stay with the model. They're there during training and then removed afterwards. There are some pre-stems nowadays that we keep with the model, but in general, they're like plug and play items. You build your model, then you have this collection of pre-stems and you snap one on for the training. When it's trained, you, you break it back off. 